All right. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the to the uh, webinar series uh, that's been put together by uh, Susan Shanian and and uh, Richard Brzezowski uh, from uh, uh, Maine, Maryland, and Ohio. We'd like to like to uh, like to welcome everybody uh, to this series. Uh, I see we got people from across the country um, participating, and uh, we sure hope that you find the. Uh, series that we have over the next four Tuesdays beneficial uh, to all of you. So I'm going to now turn it back over to uh, to Susan, and I uh, want to thank everybody for participating. And and uh, if I need to answer any other questions, just uh, refer back back to me, Susan. Okay, thank you, Roger. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to ask Dick to make a few comments. Um, yeah, well, I'm not going to wait a few minutes. Dick, if you'd like to make a few comments. Sure. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're grateful you're uh, interested in this topic as either a sheep or goat producer. And the purpose of, uh, of this series of uh, webinar sessions is to help you explore options for marketing your sheep and goats, um, your lambs, your cull ewes, your uh, uh, cull rams, um, to look into maybe market expansion, um, new markets, uh, and bottom line is better returns. So that's what we're hoping that you'll get out of it. Um, you'll, you may or may not know that there's assignments to each session. We're not going to collect homework, but it's really up to you to complete those assignments to make it a full um, educational experience. And they're listed at the uh, project website, and we'll put that up. We'll get that website to you, but you can find it just by Googling it. Um, if just say ethnic marketing of lemon button, um, Maine, and you'll probably get to it. So, um, without further ado, Susan, we're grateful that you're uh, uh, serving as a presenter instructor tonight. Uh, thank you. Proceed, please. Okay, a few people have, noted, have mentioned that there's some background noise. So, what I'm going to do to try to alleviate that is I'm going to remove speaking privileges to my two male colleagues. Okay, so as I speak now, let me know if you hear any background noise, any echoes, or if there's any problems with the audio, because I've removed um, both of them. Okay, I think we've run into problems in the past that when we allow more than one person to talk or have privileges, it, it affects the, the audio. Same thing with the video. Uh, you see the there's an opportunity to share video at the bottom left hand corner of the screen. I've just I had the video on and I just froze my face. I figure I look better frozen than live. But I have found that when we have the video on that detracts from um, technical quality and it really doesn't add anything to the presentation. So we're gonna get started with our basically our, it's a, this is a four part series and you've already um, heard from, from my collaborators, Roger High from Ohio State and Dick Brzezowski uh, from the University of Maine. Myself, I'm from the University of Maryland. Here's the schedule again. I needed to figure out how to hit the hands-free button. Just to remind you of what the schedule is, this will be the next four consecutive Tuesday nights. Uh, there's the topics and the speakers. Our intention is for each webinar to last for approximately 60 minutes, maybe shorter, maybe longer, and then an additional 30 minutes uh, be allowed for questions. You can ask questions in the chat box. I think most of you have figured out how that works. You can send questions to everyone, which is what we would prefer, but if you do need to speak uh, or communicate privately with another person or with the presenter, uh, you can do that as well. During this uh, webinar, I would, we would like you to limit your comments, your questions to our topic of marketing. And I'm going to ask Dick and Roger uh, to, to answer the questions in the chat box. And then when the presentation is over, I'll also be able to answer questions. There's other people I know that have a lot of experience in this uh, area. Feel free to make comments. And to, answer, and to answer questions. All of these webinars will be recorded. I started recording, I think, about 10 minutes of 7. I will do some minimal 
editing, and then I will make them public for viewing. There will be a link to the recordings along with the PowerPoint presentations on one of my web pages. Sheepandgoat.com is my website and it's a page called recordings.html. We'll have the recordings to this webinar series and if you're interested, uh, there's also going to be links to all of the webinars that I have ever done. Um, and they've covered most topics uh, related to sheep and goats. And as I've mentioned earlier, there's really no difference in listening to a recording versus being here live. Since you can't, since we can't interact verbally, the only interaction's in the chat box, so the only audio is me speaking, so it's really no different whether you watch it live or whether you listen to the recording. So if for some reason you have to leave early or you can't make one of the webinars or you have a friend that's interested that doesn't participate, these recordings will allow you uh, to participate. I want to talk a little bit about the sponsors of these webinars. It's three uh, states working together and it's a combination of university extension as well as our state sheep associations. And I've got a slide for each sponsor with uh, appropriate websites. Uh, so one of our sponsors is obviously the Ohio State University Extension. And by the way, I attended Ohio State University. I didn't graduate from there, but I started my college career there. So Ohio State has a, a special place uh, for me. Uh, Ohio's Sheep Association is called the Ohio Sheep Improvement Association and I've got uh, their website down. Roger High is the Executive Director of the Ohio Sheep Improvement Association and he's also the State Sheep Specialist with Ohio State University so he kinda wears both hats. There you can see uh, his email address if you would like to contact him. University of Maine is a sponsor and I have their website there along with the website they have for a foot health project. This was a uh, SARE funded project that, that Dick was able to receive several years ago. It's a really good project uh, aimed at eradicating foot rot in flocks in the Northeast. Of course, all the information is pertinent to other states and pertinent to goats as well as uh, sheep. Uh, the Maine Sheep Breeders Association, I have their website listed there because again they are a partner uh, in this webinar series. Uh, Dick's position was recently officially changed to small ruminant and poultry specialist with the University of Maine Extension and there I have his uh, email listed. And of course the university I come from is the University of Maryland. I have several of my websites listed up there. Our co-sponsor is the Maryland Sheep Breeders Association. Uh, their website's not very active but the second one sheepandwool.org that's the website for the Maryland uh, Sheep and Wool Festival and there I have my email. Feel free to contact me. This web webinar series was made possible uh, through a grant that we received uh, from the American Sheep Industry Association, which is the trade organization uh, for the sheep industry. Also does, a, does some activity with goats as well. Uh, part of uh, the association is this project called Let's Grow Our Flock. The whole idea is to increase uh, sheep production in the United States to try to rebuild and improve our infrastructure. And this is the, one of the many programs that are possible as part of that initiative. Uh, there I have the websites for both uh, ASI as well as the Grow Our Flock program. So that's just a little bit about our sponsors. The webinars are funded through, through the Let's Grow Our Flock initiative of the American Sheep Industry Association in cooperation with our state sheep associations and the programs are being done by the extension services in our respective states. So just give you a little bit of background. So if you bear with me the presentation will take just a a minute to load up there on the screen. Again, you can you can make this uh, full screen. Uh, there's a button on the lower right corner that you can make it a full screen presentation. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I basically have grown up with the ethnic market and had been involved my entire life. When I was a kid, I grew up uh, between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., where we have an absolutely outstanding demand for lambs and goats. Grew up selling uh, lambs to um, Greek Orthodox clientele. Uh, they came to the farm, slaughtered the lambs, and took them with them. 
as I've gotten older, uh, I've seen the that traditional ethnic market, uh, Orthodox Christians, is still there. Um, but the growing market, at least in a state like Maryland, has more been the Muslim market. And I've, as an adult, I, I market lambs uh, to Muslim clientele in some in various ways. Um, I have a small sheep flock myself. Uh, of course, with the university, I'm the sheep and goat specialist. We do work with uh, meat goats at our research center, but I do extension programs for both sheep and goats. And as I mentioned previously, uh, do a lot of webinar series and we'll be doing one on sheep and goat health uh, after the first of the year. So let's get started with the ethnic marketing of lamb and mutton. What I'm going to cover tonight is kind of a background, kind of an introduction uh, to the ethnic markets. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the lamb industry or, or demand for lamb as it exists now. I think most people understand that the per capita consumption of lamb is very low in this country, uh, less than a pound per person per year. It's probably um, has been that way for, for quite a while. But the consumption of lamb is significantly higher among people of certain ethnic and religious groups. And we're going to talk about who those are and, and why that's an opportunity to market. The other thing I think most people know is that population trends and immigration patterns favor an increase in the demand for lamb, mutton, and goat. Before the Second World War, most immigrants came from Europe, which traditionally, with the exception of some countries in, along the Mediterranean, aren't really big eaters of lamb. But since that time, we've been getting immigrants from many, many countries around the world, and, and many of those countries, people are used to eating lamb and goat, whether as a cultural thing uh, or as a religious thing. So a lot of the people that are now immigrating to the United States have a preference for lamb, goat, mutton in their diet. And so given those factors, the demand for lamb should, should increase. You know, among the average American, maybe not. But among these population subgroups, the opportunity is definitely there. Another important aspect of the lamb industry, and I would say it's pretty much the same for the goat industry, is usually at any given time, anywhere from a third to half of the domestic lamb market is from imports, primarily from Australia and New Zealand, even with goat. The advantage that we have when we're marketing to an ethnic consumer is that they want a fresh product, very often a freshly slaughtered product. Whereas our mainstream or commodity market is going head to head with the lamb imports that tend to be more consistent and lower price. American lamb has many advantages and can very often beat the imported product, but they can't play that fresh card as well as we can in the ethnic market. The other thing to keep in mind is that lamb is the preferred meat for the three major religions of the world. Christians, Muslims, and Jewish. It is the meat of religion. It's the religious meat. I mean, these groups will consume goat and other types of meat at some of their holidays, but typically the preference is for sheep meat, lamb or mutton. And very often we see an increase in demand prior to these major holidays, whether we're talking Easter, uh, the festival of the sacrifice, the end of Ramadan, we almost always see increases in demand. Do we always see increases in price? Well, if the supply exceeds that demand, no. But we do know that the demand is going to increase prior to those holidays. This slide compares basically the two types of markets that we have in the United States for lamb. Uh, the traditional market, what I would commonly call the commodity market, and the non-traditional market, uh, which would include the ethnic market. A few years ago, the American Sheep Industry Association had a study done. And they basically determined, uh, using all the statistics they had for slaughter and, and feedlots and, and, and sale barns, that it's almost a 50-50 split now between traditional and non-traditional land marketing. Maybe a little bit still more on the traditional side, but in the past several decades, the non-traditional share 
of the industry has been gradually increasing. And again, the non-traditional would include, or, or the ethnic market would be a large part of that. And there's pros and cons and, and different characteristics of these two respective markets. With the traditional market, we're usually talking about a higher volume. Um, from an industry standpoint, it, it has typically accounted for the higher volume of lambs. From an individual standpoint, it, it's typically uh, where our larger producers fall. There's little variability in, in the type of lamb that's sold into the traditional commodity market. From a slaughter standpoint, these are mostly large lambs from large frame breeds, and they're typically finished in feedlots. Uh, I would say a minimum of 120 pounds, but in upwards of, of more than 140 pound finish weights, carcass weights of at least 55 pounds, but above 70 pounds. So these are big lambs. These are big lambs. There's a lot of price volatility in this market. Essentially, uh, the market sets prices. Uh, we always hear that a farmer is a price taker. Well, this is the perfect example in the commodity or traditional market. The market is setting the prices that producers are receiving. Over the long term, going all the way back to the Second World War, there's been a long-term decline in production in this market or in this traditional sheep industry. This has resulted in a continuing loss of infrastructure. And I think as the industry has gotten smaller and smaller each year, um, as we've gotten to the lowest numbers we've ever had here in the recent last five years, I think we're really starting to see that loss of infrastructure. Uh, slaughterhouses uh, closing, um, you know, just losing the things that supported our industry. The American Land Board used recently uh, hired consultants to look at the, the, the sheep industry, not just the traditional market, but the non-traditional as well. Uh, this is called the Hale Report. And their basic conclusion on this traditional market is that it must change if it's to survive, if it's going to have any reversing or, or bottoming out of the industry there needs to be some changes. And it, it, the report is interesting. If you go to the uh, American Land Board website, actually uh, look up Lamb Checkoff and go to their website, and you can see both a short and long version of what the Hale report uh, recommended. And they looked at both the traditional and non-traditional markets. If we switch over and talk about the non-traditional markets, of course, of what the ethnic market is usually part of, we're looking at a lower volume market. But again, over time, this market is now almost as large as our traditional market. Demand outstrips supply. We have a greater demand uh, for lamb. And somebody asked the question, is the definition of lamb, it's essentially an animal that's less than one year of age. Um, in the live animal, we determine that by looking at the teeth. Uh, in the live or the carcass animal, we look at the, uh, the spool or break joint in the lamb. Very often a lamb can be 14, 15 months old and still qualify physiologically as being a lamb. These non-traditional markets have a lot of room to grow due to favorable demographics. Again, each year the immigrants that are coming into this country, and, <clears throat> and that's what's increasing the U.S. population. We no longer are increasing our population by itself. We need immigration to replace and increase our population. And these folks are interested in eating lamb and goat, particularly first generation. There's less price sensitivity and volatility in these markets because producers, not in all cases, because it depends on how you market, but in many cases you're able to negotiate your own prices. You're more competitive with the imported product because, again, that desire for fresh product is even stronger in the ethnic market. Very often you can get consumer feedback on your lambs. You've met the consumer. You, you've, you've seen the lamb slaughtered. Um, you can get more of an idea of, of, of if what you're doing is, is what they're interested in. There's a, a demand for many different types of lambs and goats within these non-traditional ethnic markets. It's not one size fits the box. Uh, there's markets for very young, uh, small, milk-fed lambs. There's markets for uh, yearling rams, and kind of everything in between. So you can meet these markets. Now, you have to figure out what market, market you're targeting and then see what it takes to meet it. 
but we can involve different breeds and types of sheep, different production systems and different feeding programs versus that kind of one size fits all for the commodity market. You have to make sure you match your market, but within that whole context of the ethnic market, there is a lot of variability in the type of lamb and goat that's demanded. People throw the term ethnic market out a lot. And it's, I think it's important to understand actually what an ethnic market is. It's really just a group of consumers that share a common cultural background, race, color, national origin, religion, or language. Not all of them, but some common link. And the ethnic market is a large generic term. There's no such thing really as an ethnic market. We're not talking about a single market with a single group of consumers that have the same preferences. We're talking about many, many different market segments with consumers in each of those segments or groups having different buying preferences. Again, we've got people who want that young, lightweight, milk-fed lamb, and we've got some that want that yearling ram and that 60 to 80 pound, you know, lean lamb. We've got people who want all different kinds. They don't fit into one uh, single group. And I want to give you an example of those. If we look at probably what's the two largest demand sectors for lamb, we would probably say uh, Muslims and Hispanics. Well, there is no single Muslim market. Because if you look at the Muslim population as a whole, uh, these graphics and tables shows that, that Muslims come from many different parts of the world. They come from many different countries. They speak different languages. And so they can't all be lumped into one group. You have to get to know if you have a, an opportunity uh, to market lambs to, to, to Muslim clientele, you know, you'll find out where the, that group is from and what they're looking for. And it could be different your experiences could be different than what somebody else's experiences are because it could depend on, again, what country they come from, what they're used to, where they come from. Their own interpretation of what they should, of what suits their, um, their needs. The other large group we talk about is Hispanic. So while the term Muslim ties groups together by religion, Hispanic really only ties people together, in this case, by language. Because basically the Hispanic market is basically Spanish-speaking uh, people, or people from Spanish-speaking countries. And while Mexicans comprise almost two-thirds of that group, there's a lot of other uh, groups, nationalities, represented in that broad market that we call Hispanic. So these are two very large demand segments, uh, two very large ethnic markets, but within each there's lots of much smaller markets, and within those smaller markets, different preferences, different needs, different opportunities. Continuing to talk about these two major market segments, because I think this is um, where some of our greatest opportunity exists, uh, there's a lot of information out there to try to characterize um, and look at the buying patterns of, of different groups of people. And of course, the thing to keep in mind about Hispanic market is this is the fastest growing minority group that we have. Uh, the Latin wave is bigger than the baby boomer generation. And we always talk about what the baby boomer generation, what huge impact it's going to have on Social Security and, and, you know, and other social programs and other aspects of American culture, where the Hispanic um, immigration is actually larger than that. Their buying power has increased uh, by 76% since 1990. A couple of things that, that are favorable in terms of marketing lamb, their families are larger, uh, they're more likely to cook at home and from scratch, they like fresh ingredients, and they're accustomed to, and, and, and statistics show that they're willing to spend more money on food than the average American. Well, lamb is pretty expensive, so that's a good thing to know. Switch over to the Muslim market. There's not any clear estimates on the number of Muslims in the United States. You can't ask that information uh, in the census. But there may be as many as 8 million. The growth rate is, is larger uh, than the U.S. population growth rate. The U.S. population grows by less than 1% per year, 
and it was estimated that the Muslim population is growing by 6%. And to put this in perspective, it's about the same size, size as the Hispanic community was 25 years ago. If we look at when they characterize uh, Muslim consumers, the average Muslim is younger than the average American. They're very well educated and they're very affluent. Once again, lamb is expensive. It's always good to know when people have money to spend. As I said in that earlier slide, population trends and immigration patterns favor an increase in the demand for lamb. That's a, that's a good thing. Uh, this slide right here uh, kind of gives an overview of U.S. population demographics, uh, breaking down people by race, a little bit by uh, language, uh, the number of foreign-born Americans, and income. Uh, this is for the United States as a whole. Uh, you can determine this information for your state, for your county, or for your city. And it can give you some, some kind of background information the key, some of the key statistics, I think, obviously Hispanic, it is good to know the percentage of that because that offers some opportunity. Again, you can't ask uh, questions about religion. The number of foreign-born people in the population, the higher that number is, the more opportunity there is. Um, certainly incomes can, can be used to, to compare areas. So the Census Bureau can provide some basic population demographics. Uh, this particular slide uh, shows the same information, only it, it does show it for religion. And this is based on survey data, uh, the Pew Research Foundation. Uh, given the fact that sheep meat is favored by our three major religions, it's kind of useful to know, um, you know, how, what the breakdown of religion is in this country. I don't know whether you can find this data broken down in, into states or, or counties or anything like that. The Census Bureau wouldn't have that, but there are a lot of independent organizations out there uh, that collect data, uh, evaluate data, and, and do a lot in terms of marketing. So if I look at some of these, these figures out here from a national basis, uh, they're kind of small because some of our, our market potential is um, Muslim. It's 0.6% of the population. Orthodox, which would be uh, Greek Russian Orthodox Christians is, is also 0.6, Jewish is 1.7. Those numbers don't seem very large, but they are the, nation, the nas nation as a whole. And so when we're trying to market to the ethnic market, we're looking for places where those national averages are significantly higher because that represents opportunity to us. If you're interested in, in knowing what population demographics are, uh, particularly at your location, this is some of the places that, that you can look. I think looking at population demographics provides a starting point for establishing a marketing plan for the ethnic market. You might look at the data and decide uh, there's not much opportunity or you might look at data and decide there's a lot more opportunity than perhaps you've been uh, taking advantage of. Uh, so we've got the Census Bureau, which again you can look at national, state, county, local. Pew Research Center does a lot of um, data collection on minority groups. Faith and Communities Today does a lot of, of surveys and, and things on, on religion. In fact, there's a, a pretty good report there done a year or two ago about the Muslim religions and the growth in, in the number of mosques and the and the kind of characterizes the Muslim, American Muslim population. The Allied Media Corporation does the same thing, looks at minorities from a really from a marketing standpoint. And a lot of other websites are out there that you just simply have to do a, a, an internet or a Google search. If you wanted to locate uh, the mosques in your area, those things are easily easily obtained by doing internet searches. Uh, same thing with Orthodox churches. You know, five years ago when I gave this talk, I used to give websites for that, but it's so readily available just by searching, uh, and there's so many different websites uh, that you can find. So a lot of this information is available. You can actually do research on population demographics and immigration uh, till you're blue in the face. There's so much information out there, so much data out there. Um, just a tremendous amount because of the internet. So as a producer, your first step is to identify potential ethnic consumers. 
you know, and how do you do that? Well, last two slides have talked about population demographics. That can be a starting point. You know, what is the Hispanic population? What is the African American population? The Asian population? The percent foreign born? The percent that speak Spanish? That can be a starting point. Another thing, because LAM is so tied to religious preferences, I think it's important to identify mosques uh, and Orthodox churches in your area. Sure, you can drive by them, go looking for them when you drive, but just simple internet searches. You can search for mosques uh, with your zip code. You can search with them from your state. And, of course, most mosques and even Orthodox churches um, are closer to urban population centers, but sometimes you never know where there might be a, an Islamic center. I grew, for, th for about 13 years I worked on uh, Maryland's Eastern Shore, a very rural area, and we had an Islamic center in the, um, in the town or, or small city where I worked. So you never know where you might find them. And like I said, the easiest way is to, um, is to do a Google search and find websites that allow you to search by zip code or state. Another way is to identify ethnic or, or foreign stores and businesses near to your farm. Most communities, even, even a lot of rural communities uh, or suburban communities, have ethnic stores. I have a, a sister-in-law that, that comes from the Philippines, so I've kind of tuned into those because she's always, you know, looking for stores that have uh, some of the food items that she's used to buying. Well, more and more of those stores are, are cropping up. Again, most of them are in near urban areas, but sometimes they're in these, these small towns, and they may offer an opportunity for marketing directly to them, or they might provide some contacts for you. Universities and colleges usually have a lot of um, foreign or, or ethnic uh, faculty and students, uh, and that can be a good place to identify potential consumers. Don't overlook doctors and other professionals as potential consumers of lamb and goat. Many, in many, you look at the medical profession and it has a great deal of diversity in terms of, of uh, the ethnicity. And so there's some real opportunity. I know a lot of people who've uh, marketed lamb or goat to their doctors. And, and again, doctors and, and, and other professionals are, are you know, they're, they're affluent. They can afford to purchase lamb. We make this assumption that a lot of ethnic, that the ethnic markets are a low-end market. Uh, when in reality, at least we're talking about uh, picking out the Muslim sector, they are not. A, a low income consumer group. They're actually the opposite. They're probably more affluent than the average American. They have a lot of professional positions and so there's definitely some opportunity. You want to identify farms or other businesses that may employ seasonal foreign or immigrant labor. Um, this can particularly be beneficial in states that don't have larger urban populations of, of uh, immigrants or ethnic consumers but, but who bring in uh, workers from various countries. They can be another potential place to market. So once you've identified potential consumers, how do you go about targeting them in terms of, of trying to uh, establish a connection for marketing? Well, this takes legwork. You need to visit mosques, churches, and community centers. You need to contact foreign student associations. Sometimes just going to the sale barn or a slaughterhouse, you can make connections. Many times the buyers uh, for the ethnic markets are at those sale barns. Sometimes the ethnic, uh, sometimes people who you could directly sell to are at those sale barns. Some of the slaughterhouses are um, operated by Muslims and other ethnic groups, and you can make those contacts. Advertising in ethnic media, and I think I mean two things there. One, advertising media that ethnic people might read. For example, you take the Washington Post. You know, it's an urban newspaper, and 
and you never, you know, you might gain access because most most ethnic groups or clientele or customers live in the urban areas, hitting some of these big city newspapers, but also finding publications uh, that are specific uh, to their communities. You know, whether it's running and you know just an ad, but uh, finding a way to connect with them, putting notices up at ethnic stores and businesses. Um, can help. Listing your farm on available websites, and this isn't specific to the ethnic market, but it's important because people use the internet. I can't tell you how many people contact me because they saw my website or they saw a listing on a, on a website. We have a website in Maryland called MarylandAg.org or .com, I can't remember which. And we list sheep and goat farms. Of course, it has a lot of other listings. But a lot of farmers tell me that they are contacted on that list uh, by uh, people wanting to buy lamb or goat. Of course, the ideal situation, too, would be to establish your own website. And websites can be simple and, and not be that expensive. And if you're on the Internet and they can find you, it can be another way to make those connections. And a lot of things about the ethnic market, at least from a direct sales standpoint, and again, there are lots of ways to sell lambs to the ethnic market, a lot of it starts out relatively small and grows. It's a word of mouth thing. You know, if somebody finds out about you, they're satisfied with them, they're going to pass that information on to others. So sometimes it might not, you know, you might not have you might have just what you perceive to be a small demand, but that can grow once the word gets out. And the whole idea of doing some of these different things on this slide is just kind of a way to get your name out and, and to get yourself known and to get started, and then it kind of just spreads from there. And, of course, the final step is actually marketing to ethnic consumers. You know, you've identified potential consumers. You've, you've uh, picked out the, the, the markets that you're going to aim for and you've figured out how to make contact with them, so how do you market to them? Well, one of the very important things that you need to do is determine the type of lamb your customers want, when they want it, and how they want it. And that's going to be covered in the second webinar by Catherine Harris, uh, Catherine's um, Blystone Farm. Uh, they raise sheep and they also have a butcher shop, and, and they, um, it'll be, you know, she'll, she'll talk about their experiences specifically with the customers because while the commodity market, traditional market wants a certain kind of lamb, I mean I can perfectly describe the kind of lamb they want, but the ethnic market is going to depend on the individual group of customers that you're marketing to and it's essential that you know what kind of lamb they want and when they want it and how they want it. And so she's going to talk about in the second, in the second webinar. You need to look at your marketing options. There's no one way to market to an ethnic market because it can be everything from taking a lamb to a sale barn, which is really in a lot of ways a commodity market, to selling meat uh, to an ethnic consumer and, and everything in between. And so in the third webinar I'll be back with you and I'm going to talk about the different options and the pros and cons of different options. If you sell a live animal, are you going to sell meat? Where is it going to be slaughtered? Uh, On-farm slaughter. This slaughter is of course the highest level of inspection and there's no restrictions on the sale of meat when it's properly labeled. It has to be labeled to sell meat. It's not that it's just it's slaughtered in a federally inspected plant, but it also has to be properly labeled. Lots of requirements uh, for the facility, uh, for the inspection of the facility, HACCP plans required for every step of the processing. Uh, there's a pre and post mortem inspection of, of the animal. But you can do anything. If the animals are slaughtered there, you can do anything. You can sell them anywhere. You can sell meat. The problem or the challenge is, is we don't always have access to federally inspected slaughter wherever we're at. I'm really lucky. There's like three of them really close to where I live. The problem is they're pretty darn expensive, but they are available. And then the other problem sometimes is um, a lot of the ethnic market or some of the ethnic market uh, needs specialized slaughter. Uh, in the case of Muslim, it needs to be halal. And that's not always possible or not always uh, uh, being done in federally inspected slaughterhouse. The URL at the bottom is basically the, um, 
uh, URL for the Food Safety and Inspection Service of USDA. If you go to that website and you make those choices, Toppets, Inspection, and FSIS, Inspected Establishment, you'll find a listing by state of USDA or federally inspected plants. That can be really uh, useful information to have. Uh, I know. I think it may indicate what species they slaughter as well. Certainly, poultry versus livestock, but should hopefully also list whether they slaughter sheep and goats. No lit indication of whether they do religious slaughter. The next level of inspection is state, and basically, state inspection is operated on a federal-state partnership. State meat inspection must be at least equal to federal inspection. In most cases, the state regulations mirror the federal regulations, although they can the states can make some additional regulations. The sale of the meat, ironically, is limited to the sales within the state of slaughter. So even though it's the same standards as federal inspection, in most cases you can only sell it within the state. If you kind of operate in the middle of a state, that's not a real big deal. But if you kind of operate on the fringes of a state and your markets are over the state lines, this can be a real problem. Only 27 of the 50 states still have state meat inspection programs. I know in Maryland we haven't had state meat inspection for more than 20 years. It was budget cuts and we lost state meat inspection. So in those states, uh, if you're a producer in those states, you're subject to federal regulations along with any additional regulations your state or county imposes. The website at the bottom, same website, Food Safety and Inspection Service, if you click Topics, then Inspection, then State Inspection and Cooperative Agreements, you can find out which states have state meat inspection. Having state meat inspection hopefully makes uh, additional um, options available to you for slaughter. Because I can tell you one of the challenges with the ethnic markets and the non-traditional markets is access to slaughter. And maybe even access to a certain kind of slaughter. Uh, custom exempt slaughter. This is probably a really important um, one for the ethnic markets. Custom exempt means it's exempt from continuous inspection. There's sanitary requirements for the slaughter facility and there are inspection requirements. However, there's no pre or post-mortem inspection of animals. In other words, there doesn't need to be an inspector there all the day, all the time, which, which helps to cut expenses. The facilities um, aren't as expensive, so hopefully the cost of slaughter is not going to be as expensive as it is for federal. The meat must be stamped not for resale and it's returned to the owner. It must be consumed by the owner, his family, non-paying guests, and employees, no one else. You can't sell the meat. It's not for resale. When you're using custom exempt to, to market to an ethnic market or to a, um, or to a consumer, it's essential that you sell a live animal. Because essentially custom slaughter means they're killing it for the owner. They're killing it for the owner. So if you're using these markets, be sure to sell a live animal, invoice a live animal. It's okay to deliver the animal to the processing plant, but you should be paid for a live animal and the buyer should pay the processing costs. Personal exemption, the fourth, kind of the fourth level. And basically this is no inspection of neither the facility or the animal. And it allows a farmer to slaughter an animal of his own raising. I raised the lamb on my farm, I can kill it and put it in my freezer. Just like the custom exempt, the consumption of that meat is limited to myself, my family, and my non-paying guests and my employees. That meat can't be sold. Okay, It can't be used for a, a church picnic. It, it meets, needs the same requirements. Now the bigger question about personal exemption is, and I open a can of worms when I, when I start this discussion, but does USDA's personal exemption allow the buyer of a live animal to slaughter the animal for his own use? I already indicated that I, where I grew up, we sold lambs to Greek customers. They killed those lambs on our property and they took them with them. We did that. Most states consider the on-farm slaughter of an animal to be illegal unless the person raised it. Again, my farm, I can kill my own animal, but I can't sell it. Uh, to the guy in the red, although I did. I sold a lamb to, the, to those gentlemen and they killed it on my farm. But most states consider it to be illegal. In fact, Illinois actually added an ownership requirement that you have to own the animal for at least 30 days. What most states are hung up on or, or don't like is they don't want that buyer to kill the lamb on my farm. I don't think, and, and people can comment otherwise, but I don't think they care if that buyer takes that lamb somewhere else and kills it. But they think that when a farmer allows the buyer to kill the lamb on their farm, that they should have a slaughter facility. And I can tell you the reality, and I've studied this issue quite extensively, and I've read everything I can that's written on it. 
the USDA and most states, since they really just duplicate uh, federal standards, they actually don't address the legal rights of the buyer to slaughter his own animal. There, there's nothing that says the buyer can't slaughter the animal, and there's nothing that says he can. It's just simply not addressed. And for that reason, to me, it's open to interpretation. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Here's three states. In New York, the owner of the animal is considered to be the owner when he or she purchases it. In other words, the owner can slaughter the lamb on the farm where he purchased it. The seller must sell a live animal, similar to custom example, and he must not assist in the slaughter in any way. This is published in a number of Cornell publications that it is allowed for the buyer to slaughter an animal. The state of Vermont recently passed a law uh, that will allow the on-farm slaughter of up to 25 sheep or 3,500 pounds of live animal. Now, the slaughter site must be sanitary and designed to prevent water pollution. I believe there is actually an inspection, but it's not the same as a custom exempt slaughterhouse. I mean, you don't have to go to these great lengths to be able to slaughter this small number of animals. Most states are like North Carolina. All slaughter must take place in an approved facility regulated by the respective State Department of Agriculture, and the only exemption is for the person who raised the animal. So most states are probably like North Carolina. Vermont is to be applauded for taking a step to clarify it and allow uh, small farmers and to, to sell to the ethnic market in this way and to provide the ethnic consumer with a way to meet their needs. Uh, there are a few states like New York. Uh, I believe Mar Maryland is just like New York. I'm kind of a little bit uh, shy about printing it like New York has, but I, in our state, uh, this is done quite extensively uh, without a problem. So it's going to vary. And so what I tell people is be sure to know the laws in your own state and how they are interpreted and how they are enforced. There is a lot of black market slaughter that should be shut down, that sh gives a lot of folks a bad name. But that doesn't mean all on-farm slaughter is that way. So where do you find out what the laws in your state are? There's a lot of different places. Uh, state Department of Agriculture is where your meat and poultry inspection usually is, Department of Health, County Departments of Health, um, the Food Safety and Inspection Service, uh, State Extension Services. Uh, E-Extension has a nice little uh, website called the Niche Meat Processor Assistant Network. So there's some, there's some resources out there. But be sure, don't just ask your neighbor. Uh, look for it in writing. And the, the most logical place is through the State Department of Agriculture. But I can't emphasize how important it is to know what's legal in your state. And even if your state and my state have the same words in the law, there can be differences in how they're interpreted. So the last thing you want to do is, is end up in trouble. I applaud Vermont because I think this is what the states need to do. Not argue over whether it's legal, but find a way um, to make it legal with some inspection, but not to the same degree of building a full-scale plant. A little bit about religious slaughter, and I know uh, Catherine Harris, I think, is going to go into this in her presentation next week. Um, but this is a very important part of the ethnic market. Uh, and basically, when we say religious slaughter, we're talking about either halal for Muslim and kosher for Jewish. Uh, this type of slaughter is exempt from U.S. humane slaughter laws. In no way does that imply it's inhumane. It's just different. Uh, the primary difference is that animals are not stunned uh, prior to slaughter. However, they should be properly restrained. Uh, this picture shows a restraining device that um, we had a marketing project uh, based out of Cornell a number of years ago, and they uh, designed this, um, this restraining device for uh, ethnic slaughter. Uh, a lot of the other aspects of halal and kosher are open to interpretation by Muslims in particular, but in many cases the slaughter has to be done by an adult Muslim or a rabbi in the case of kosher. Unfortunately, in some locations, there's going to be a limited access to plants that will perform religious or especially certified slaughter. And this can be an obstacle to marketing to, to those markets. One option may be that in some custom-exempt plants, um, the customer or a Muslim may be able to buy a lamb or goat and may be able to perform his own slaughter. And he can do that in halal fashion. That may be a possibility, particularly with live markets. This was a 
poster uh, that came out of that uh, program, marketing program out of Cornell. Uh, they have a website, uh, www.sheepmarketing.info. This is a poster that shows uh, humane halal on-farm slaughter. So again, in, in New York, this is this is legal, and so this post was created. We've distributed it in Maryland as well because it, this slaughter is legal in Maryland. Probably not in most states, though. Um, basically, this is kind of my last slide. What are the pros and cons to marketing lamb and mutton to the ethnic consumer? Well, the pros are, and a lot of these things I've already talked about, it's a growth market. There's a higher demand higher prices and profit are possible, not guaranteed, but possible. Uh, in many cases you can negotiate prices if you're selling live animals off the farm um, or selling to an order buyer or something, you can uh, negotiate prices. Uh, there's less price volatility, although that also depends on how you market it. Less price sensitivity because in many cases if it's a certain holiday you know they're going to eat lamb and they're going to eat it no matter what it costs within reason. If you remember a couple years ago lamb prices were sky high and um, we actually reached a point I think where people chose uh, um, other meats you know they're, but to a large degree they're going to eat lamb no matter what it costs. Um, the ethnic markets may enable us to get feedback from our consumers to know that we're producing the right thing we may be able to develop markets for what I consider less desirable animals, uh, cull ewes and rams, uh, thinner animals, ones that wouldn't fit really well into the commodity market. The other thing is with the ethnic markets, um, particularly some of them, not all of them, but sometimes you can hold lambs without losing market acceptance. Really in the commodity markets, for the most part, when a lamb's ready to go, he needs to go. Um, you know, or he's going to you know, it, it, he's either going to get too fat or he's going to go in the opposite direction. But with the ethnic markets, because they don't desire as conditioned a lamb or a certain grade of lamb, uh, sometimes we can hold those lambs. What are some of the negative aspects of the ethnic markets? Well, you do need to learn the customs of different groups. You can't just assume they're just like you are. Um, the marketing opportunities are going to be limited um, by region, by population demographics. You know, you may live in an area where there's nothing but a bunch of people that don't eat lamb, that are all American, that are all white, and there's not a lot of opportunity. Because again, keep in mind, ethnic groups tend to live in or near large urban centers. There may be pockets of ethnic groups in rural areas, uh, farm labor, a college or university, um, or for some reason a particular group is settled in a rural area, but for the most part they're in the urban areas. So you may not always be able um, even if you want to, you may not have much of an opportunity. Uh, language and cultural differences, not everybody's comfortable trying to sell lamb to somebody who doesn't speak English well. Um, the dates of, of religious observance is going to change each year. A lot of them are based on the sighting of the moon and not the sun, so they're based on a lunar calendar. The Muslim holidays move forward 11 days every year. So you live long enough, they're going to cover every, every month of the year. So you're going to have to adjust your production and management if that's the market you're targeting. Easter doesn't bounce around more than about six weeks, but it will. Sometimes it's going to be in late March, sometimes it's going to be in early May, and you may need to make adjustments. Um, one of the biggest disadvantages of the, of the ethnic markets, at least from a religious standpoint, is the demand is concentrated a few times during the year. We had a slaughterhouse open in Maryland that wanted to cater to the Muslim market. They figured out they couldn't make money killing a lot of lambs a couple of times a year. They needed a year-round market. They needed to be able to sell lambs year-round, so they didn't make it. So demand is concentrated a few times during the year. My experience is that more and more producers are understanding the markets and the religious holidays, and they're sticking their lambs in the market, and we're getting lower prices. Because even though the demand's going up, we're flooding the markets. If we choose direct marketing as a way to, to market to the ethnic market, that can be very time-consuming. And probably the biggest disadvantage, um, at least I know sometimes from my standpoint, is um, you may need to change the way you raise sheep. I can honestly tell you that the way I learned to raise sheep in many ways is the opposite of what the ethnic market wants. Very often, um, you know, they don't want the lambs docked or castrated. They don't want them well fed. And sometimes that can be hard to deal with. You may need to have different breeds. 
than what you're accustomed to. You may need to make changes and um, you know hopefully those changes are, are, are result in a profit and so whatever discomfort you feel initially is you get over that but there may, you may need to make changes. You may need to make changes in terms of when you lay them and, um, and all of those kinds of things. And you may, yeah, I guess the bottom line too though is if you, particularly if you live in the eastern part of the United States, you may already be marketing to the ethnic market and not even really know. Um, this is the sale report from New Holland, which with the exception of San Angelo, Texas is probably the largest sheep and goat market in the country. And I would say from a price standpoint, probably the best market in the country. And I've got the word non-traditional circled and what this market report indicates is that all lambs are marketed to non-traditional markets. So there are no commodity lambs, there are no feeder lambs. All of these lambs go to slaughter and they go to the ethnic market. So you can see everything from a 40 to 60 pound lamb uh, to 110 to 120 pound lambs. So the ethnic markets use a lot of different kinds of lambs, um, but they're all non-traditional. Uh, there's three types of grades, four types of grades listed here. Um, different prices for each of those. Some of them that you look down at the 21 head at the bottom, shorn utility and good. I was told as long as I live I'll never see a lamb that's utility, utility and good. So I'm assuming these are just some pretty rough thin lambs. And then we go up and we've got some choice and prime yield grade three to four lambs, uh, you know, bringing a really good price. So uh, the ethnic market is taking all different sizes of lambs and all different qualities of lambs. Uh, this report now separates uh, hair sheep out, and I've been following these patterns and uh, for the lot, ever since they started doing this, and I find that sometimes the hair sheep lamp, <coughs> excuse me, will actually sell outsell the conventional lamps. So the hair sheep are becoming a bigger part of the marketplace, particularly uh, with the ethnic markets. And with that, I will conclude. I, I apologize for our little. Uh, glitch there in the middle when things just started a flashing. It was kind of fun to watch it for a minute, but I thought it would come back and it didn't. So I went out and came back in. Somebody asked a question about prices per hundred. Yes, those are prices per hundred. Just to remind you, next week's webinar, same time, same place. Um, the topic is going to be understanding the ethnic consumer and the speaker will be Katherine Harris from Blystone Farm and Butcher Shop in Ohio. So she and her family operate a butcher shop and so can give you first-hand experience in their dealings with different types of ethnic consumers. She's going to talk about religious slaughter and, and that sort of thing, and she's going to talk a lot from experience. And I'm going to try to give Dick back the microphone so he can tell you what your homework is. i got to find him. i got to go down this long list. There he is. Dick, I'm giving you the microphone. You're on. You're on. Hey, thank you, Susan. Nice job tonight. So there's a, each, after each session, there's some assignments to do, and that's for you to um, enhance your educational experience by completing the assignments. No one's going to collect them. They're really for your benefit. And so I just posted um, on the in the chat box the site to go to, but if you can't find it or can't, uh, um, click on it now. If you just uh, googled Maine Extension, so the state of Maine, Maine Extension, and then when you get the University of Maine Cooperative Extension website, there's a search box in the upper right hand corner. Just write ethnic marketing and you'll get you know, and click go and you'll get to that site and there's a whole um, tab for assignments. So right now there's only three up there. Um, the first one is all about um, understanding the um, regulations in your state and so that's the one we want you to complete. There's really two for the first session. Uh, the other one's about um, abattoirs in your state um, so in your, or region. So if you go to that website you'll be able to uh, find the assignments and complete them. Thank you.